Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first lecture on this, our Grand Japan Tour. My name is Ross Arnold. I think most of you have been in the meetings when um, I was introduced by Anna. I just very quickly about who I am. This is my wife, Carolyn, who's the videographer down here in front. Um, this is our 15th cruise where I've lectured for Windstar going back about six, starting about six years ago. And uh, later on, I want to give you a website where the videos of all of the lectures I have done in all of that time, plus a lot more, are available free of charge. And so I'll let you know where you can, if you miss any of the lectures in this series, or you want to go back and recheck some of the video, uh, the, uh, the visuals, then that will be available to you. Um, I am senior pastor of a church in Mexico. My wife and I live in uh, Lake Chapala, Mexico. I also am a senior lecturer at Lakeside Institute of Theology. But in terms of my lecturing, this has, um, you know, it's developed over time with Windstar in terms of we've been in most parts of the world except for South America, I think, you know, in, 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 in our uh, efforts to communicate about the sites where we're going. Because my background is in theology, actually philosophical theology, I began by studying and then lecturing on world religions. Then I got more and more interested and involved in the cultures and the history of the areas that uh, out of which those religions came, and that sort of has developed into this. Uh, been on sabbatical for the last year, and so my wife and I have been traveling a great deal. We'll be on board the legend this time for two months, uh, going all the way to Seward, Alaska. How many of you all are going to Seward, Alaska? Well, that's too bad. <laughs> no, I mean, it's great for you, and it's great for, for Windstar. I say it's too bad because, unfortunately, I'm going to be repeating some of the lectures that you will hear on this trip when we make the crossing, because we have nine sea days crossing the North Pacific. So you'll hear, um, you know, if you fall asleep, which uh, it's never happened before in one of my lectures, but if anybody should <laughs> not off, then you would be more than welcome to listen to this again. Okay. Um, today we'll want to talk about the birth of the atomic age, destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The reason I'm doing this lecture today is because, of course, we arrive in Hiroshima tomorrow, and then Nagasaki, I think, three stops later. But uh, this is not how we would ordinarily start out this lecture series. This is not the topic that I would begin with, and you'll understand why in a few minutes. These are the lectures I'll be giving for you over the, the course of this cruise uh, tomorrow afternoon and be sure to check your daily programs because depending upon arrival departure depending upon some other activities on board the ship it varies somewhat today is at four usually it's at five o'clock tomorrow we'll be talking about the religions of japan shinto and buddhism and some of the other influences that led to that um, then a brief history of korea and the korean conflict or korean war and we'll talk about why is it conflict war police action what is that uh, that's right before we arrive in Busan, South Korea. Emperors and Shoguns, a brief history of Japan, followed by Samurai and the Code of Bushido. So we'll be talking about the Samurai Code of Ethics, sort of their version of chivalry, if you will. Then Islands of Tranquility, Japanese Gardens, so that some of the gardens, and you'll see some beautiful Japanese gardens on this trip. We just did the same voyage in reverse, so we know what you're going to be seeing. We'll talk about how Japanese gardens are constructed, what's the sort of aesthetic behind them, how they're put together, what different kinds there are, and that sort of thing. Then Japanese art and architecture, Japan versus China. Um, Japan and China have been in two wars against one another, and those have significantly impacted the sort of history and development of the whole East Asian region. So we'll discuss that. And then finally, the Pacific War, that is the Second World War and the Pacific Theater. And we'll, we'll discuss um, just some of the high points, some of the major turning points in that war and uh, how that all developed. But, um, and, and then you get to find out who won. Um, <laughs> I want to start with this picture. And again, in, in the next three minutes, I'm going to give you a huge number of data points. But the reason I wouldn't ordinarily start with this lecture is because um, I'm going to be unfolding this history as I go along. But I think it's important for you to get the talks before we arrive at the places where we're going so that you have a context for what you, you experience when you get there. And so that's why we're talking about this right now. This picture is the Meiji Emperor family. This is actually the Meiji Emperor. This picture was taken in the 1880s. And it's critical for you to notice the fact that apart from the children, the adults are wearing what in the 1880s would have been very modern Western European style clothing. Prior to the Meiji Emperor, um, 
Japan had been for almost for around 700 years under the control of a military dictatorship called the Shogun. You've all probably either seen uh, James Clavell's book, The Shogun, or you've seen the miniseries on TV a number of years ago. Shogun was the military leader, the Generalissimo, and for about 700 years, the military ruler was the ruler of Japan. The emperor was just a figurehead. The, um, the Meiji Restoration, as it's called, which happened from 1866 to 1868, and then this emperor continued on until 1912, but the Meiji Restoration was when some of the daimyos, and you'll get some of this terminology later, the daimyos were the clan leaders. They were the ones who were heads of families that were the ruling families around Japan. They were under the shogun. Well, these daimyos or clan lords, some of them rebelled against the shogun. They uh, overthrew the shogun, the Tokugawa shogun, and threw him out in 1868 at the end of a, of a war that they fought and they restored the power of the emperor so that he was no longer just a figurehead he then again was the ruler of japan in a real sense and not just you know prior to that while the shogun was in power the emperor and the whole court in the capital city were just for show they really didn't have any power so the meiji restoration led to the the meiji emperor coming into power and the reason for the western clothes is because the last 200 years or so under the shoguns, Japan had been in isolation, um, a, a period called the Sukuro, which they were not allowing any foreigners to come into Japan, and they were not allowing any ordinary Japanese to leave the country. Well, in 1853, an American, actually four American gunships under Commodore Matthew Perry sailed into uh, Edo Harbor, and uh, Edo being uh, Tokyo, that's where the capital was then, and in a very friendly way said, if you don't open your borders to us and, and trade with us, then we're going to show you what our gunships are able uh, to do. And they had <laughs> modern weapons, powerful ships, and Matthew Perry um, gave them a year. He actually came back in six months with seven gunships. This is the beginning of what was called gunship diplomacy um, in terms of the U.S. role. And as a result of that, the Shogun, who was still in charge at that point, opened the borders to the American traders and then in very short order other Western European powers after 200 years of isolation. Well, when the Meiji Restoration happened, having seen how powerful the Western navies and the Western military was, how much more advanced they had been after two years of isolation in Japan, the Meiji Emperor decided that they were going to have a crash program of modernization in Japan. And over the next 30 to 40 years, it, it's astonishing how much they moved into the modern world. They were committed to industrialization, to becoming a manufacturing country, not just a, a, an agricultural one, and particularly to upgrade and modernize the military. So that uh, the goal of the Meiji Emperor was to make them competitive with the, the most powerful of the Western powers. Well, um, in doing that, he had one problem. Japan had no oil. They had virtually no coal and almost no iron except in the very southern areas. So they did not have the resources they really desperately needed in order to be able to modernize and become the modern country they wanted to be, to compete with the West. So Japan started looking first to Korea, closest to them, as a place that had those resources. And they started competing, and I'll get into all the details of all this as we talk about uh, the, the Korean War and various other things. But the, the Japanese started competing with China, who had been the uh, really in control of Korea. Technically, Korea was its own country, but China was calling the shots. And the disagreements and various other problems until in 1894 and 95, Japan and China declared war against each other. This is the first Sino-Japanese war. And to everyone's astonishment, except perhaps the Japanese, in six months, tiny little Japan, who really had not been thought about very much by the West, defeated China, which had the largest standing army in Asia. It had the, uh, historically it had been the power in Asia. So the Japanese defeat uh, China. They take over control uh, of Korea at that point, And they also had been ceded uh, control over part of Manchuria, which is part of China, after they defeated China, as well as the island of Taiwan was given to them, the Pescadores Islands, some other areas. Well, when they decided to try to take advantage of some of the resources in Manchuria as well, in China, the Russians took exception to that because the Russians were desperate to get a warm water port. The only port they had on the Pacific Ocean for their Pacific fleet was Vladivostok, further up the coast, 
and it freezes in in the wintertime. So Russia got France and Germany on their side to convince the Japanese don't move any, don't move into Manchuria even though the Chinese said you could. Well, a few months later, after convincing the Japanese they didn't want to have a problem with Russia and France and Germany, the uh, Russians signed a 25-year lease for, man, for sections, the Laidong Peninsula especially, which I'll show you later, and so that they could put a port there called Port Arthur. The Japanese kept trying to negotiate with Russia. They kept wanting to talk to the Tsar and say, look, we won't bother you in Manchuria if you'll let us have uh, sort of our run of authority in Korea. The Tsar wouldn't even talk to them. He wouldn't even negotiate with them. He didn't think they were worth the trouble. At one point, he was racist. At one point, the Tsar Nicholas, who was the Tsar who eventually was thrown out of power, Tsar Nicholas called the Japanese uh, those little yellow monkeys. Well, much to his um, dismay, after a surprise attack on Port Arthur, the new port that they had built in the south, the Russians had built in the south, the um, Japanese defeated Russia in a war, the first Russo-Japanese war in 1904-1905, which has been called the most important war that nobody remembers. They not only defeated Russia, little, little Japan, compared to massive Russia, they destroyed two of Russia's three global fleets. Um, the Tsar sailed a, after they defeated the Pacific fleet of the Russians, the Japanese sat and waited. The Tsar sent a fleet from the Baltic Sea all the way around the end of, of Africa, all the way back up again. It took seven months to get there, and as soon as they arrived, the Japanese were waiting for them and they destroyed that fleet. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, the president, ended up having to negotiate, he moderated the peace treaty, and for that he got a Nobel Peace Prize, by the way. That's how Teddy Roosevelt got a Nobel Peace Prize. But I'm getting into too much detail for right now. <laughs> Once they defeated the Russians, they had authority to run uh, Korea however they wanted, and in 1910 they annexed Korea, <laughs> and they started taking over more control in Manchuria. In 1931, the Japanese stopped trying to pretend that China was in charge of Manchuria. They invaded Manchuria and set up a puppet state called Manchukuo. And so they now control Korea, they annexed it, so technically on the maps of that time, Korea, after 1910, was part of Japan. They took over a large chunk of Manchuria, called it Manchukuo, and then in 1937, Japan declares war on China for the second time, because they decide that, you know, we want, they're going to take over even more of the area of China and more in order to get the resources they felt they needed. I'll get into more detail on all that stuff later, but I promise not to be boring about it if I can help it. In the 1920s and 30s, following um, the the war with the first war with uh, China, the war with Russia, the Japanese began to see an ascent of a right-wing, militaristic, imperialistic element within their government. More and more, the military was taking authority from the you know the civilian political authorities. The feelings began to be more and more that Japan had not only the right but the responsibility to take the resources they needed. They learned from the Western powers. They had seen how the powers in Western Europe and even America, when they saw something they needed that was in a weaker country, they just took it. And so Japan said, well, if these other nations are doing that, why can't we? And so they developed a policy of imperialistic expansion in order to be able to assure themselves the resources they needed to, in order to continue to grow and develop. In the 1930s, the Great Depression, which we think of as being an American phenomenon, we being, for those Americans on board, forgive me if I ever say we, um, it, it's a convenient pronoun for me as an American who lives in Mexico, weird, <laughs> but um, I, I mean the Western, sort of Western powers. But the Great Depression in the 1930s affected the whole world. It wasn't just an American depression. And at that time, it got much worse for Japan because they were not able to trade for many of the things they needed. There simply weren't the resources available to do that. So they developed more and more uh, military extremism. Uh, the, part, the military started demanding more and more concessions of the political parties until finally they got rid of all the political parties. They merged into one. And in 1941, General Hideki Tojo was made the prime minister of Japan. And at that, from that point, the military was the government of Japan for all intents and purposes. As a result of all that, I mentioned that it was 1941 when Tojo became prime minister. 
as Japan looked around, they had a desire and interest in expanding their control. They had already taken over Manchuria and called it Manchuko. This, of course, is, is Japan. You'll notice that Korea and Manchuko, Manchuria, are part of Japan. They had, uh, because they declared war in 1937, they had taken over large sections of the rest of China. They controlled all of the port areas. They then began to control uh, some other areas. They saw there's oil and other resources they needed down in French Indochina, British Malaya, um, the, and various other areas. The thing that, that they had most concern about in terms of something that might stop them from their ambition to try to expand and grow and get the resources they needed to be a great power was the United States Navy because that was the only power the Japanese considered to be strong enough in this region of the world to be able to stop them from the expansionism that they were pursuing. And so on December 7th, of course, as most of you would know, of 1941, the Japanese early in the morning launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaiian Islands um, against the United States Navy. The, I'll talk about that in more specific terms in um, when we talk about the Pacific War. But the thing, again, most people don't realize is that within seven hours of attacking Pearl Harbor, a United States naval uh, center at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese also attacked Wake Island, Guam, and the Philippines, all of which were U.S.-controlled areas, and the British uh, mandates at Hong Kong, Singapore, and Burma. All of that in one day, all within seven hours of the launch of the attack. It was a, it was a coordinated attack so that they ended up controlling all of these areas. Some of those, Hong Kong and Singapore, particularly Singapore, was considered impregnable, and it did not take the Japanese long to, uh, to conquer it. So the Japanese at that point began advancing through the Pacific. Their goal was to set up a line of defense along here and to continue expand far enough out that they would be able to have a perimeter of defense that no one, even the United States, would not be able to, uh, to break through. From December of 1941 till April of 1942, the Japanese were completely, uh, completely victorious. No one was able to stop them. No effort was successful in stopping the uh, Japanese Imperial Navy from continuing to conquer. And then in um, April of 1942, there was the Battle of the Coral Sea. This is the Coral Sea here. The Japanese had a plan to cut off the northeastern side of access to Australia, and doing so, cut them off from the other allies and be able to control that part of the world so that Australia would be isolated. And eventually they considered the possibility of invading Australia. The Coral Sea Battle, the Battle of Coral Sea, um, in April of 1942 was the first time that any battle had not gone the Japanese way. They were not defeated, they actually sunk more uh, American ships in that battle than the other way around, but they were not successful in uh, taking control of Port Moresby in New Guinea and some of these other areas down here. So that was the first sort of stutter in the Japanese efforts. But what really uh, stopped them in June of 1942, uh, we have the Battle of Midway. It was the desire of the Japanese. This is, um, whoops, sorry. I keep saying I need either to get smaller thumbs or a bigger remote. Um, <laughs> There we go. This, of course, is Pearl Harbor. Japan over here. Midway Island, the Japanese considered a major priority that they take Midway Island for several reasons. One, that would guarantee that there was no potential for there being a land base for any aircraft that could reach Japan. Um, in April, 16 B-25 bombers under um, Jimmy Doolittle had flown off the air deck of an aircraft carrier and had succeeded in bombing Tokyo. Now, they did no damage to speak of, but it was a moral victory. They had to land in China. The point was there were no land bases close enough to Japan to allow the Allied forces to attack the main islands. Uh, and so the Japanese wanted to push that, that uh, further and further out. This line right here was where they had control to. Up to that point, they wanted to take Midway. From there, the Japanese could have attacked Pearl Harbor. And from Pearl Harbor, if they took control of it, they could attack, of course, the coast of the United States if they needed to. So that was the plan. And they uh, thought that if they could surprise the American aircraft carrier fleets at Midway and destroy them, then that would throw the American Navy out of the war, that they would have to step back and not be involved in the war anymore. 
It had been the desire of the Japanese to destroy the American aircraft carriers at Pearl Harbor, but to their dismay, the aircraft carriers were out of Pearl Harbor during the attack on December 7th of 1941. They were out on maneuvers. They did um, either sink or damage eight aircraft carriers. Uh, the, all of them, the ones the, of the four that were sunk, three of them were raised and, and later on were used in the war. Only the Arizona, of course there's now the Arizona Memorial in Hawaii, only the Arizona was not raised. The, it was astonishing how quickly the Americans proved able to repair ships and get them back in battle. There were several times, including the USS Yorktown, another aircraft carrier, that the Japanese thought they had destroyed in the Coral Sea, but the Americans fixed it so quickly that a little over a month later in Midway, they were able to use it in that battle. So the Japanese at Midway were trying to, to ambush, surprise the American aircraft carriers. Uh, but the Americans by this time had broken the Japanese code. They knew they were coming. They knew where and when they were coming. So the Battle of Midway, right here, was the turning point and to a great extent in the war. In that battle, the Americans sank the four uh, four fleet aircraft carriers that the Japanese had, and a lot of their experienced pilots were killed, a lot of their aircraft were destroyed. At that point, the senior commanders of the um, Japanese Navy were confidentially admitting to one another that at that point, when four of their major aircraft carriers were destroyed, and a lot of others, uh, cruisers, destroyers, other ships, there really was very little chance after Midway that they were going to win the war. And this was just in May of 1942, or June in 1942, excuse me. So, um, but at that point, a process began from the Allies, primarily the Americans, but the British were involved, and certainly the Australians from down here. General, uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz started a process across the center of the Pacific, uh, Douglas MacArthur, who had been driven out of the Philippines and was ordered to go to Australia and was commanding, uh, he was in charge of the Army, Chester Nimitz was in charge of the Navy. MacArthur began a process of coming up from the south, up through the, the islands, uh, the <laughs> East Indies, up into the Philippines. At the same time that Chester Nimitz, the Admiral, was coming across, they ended up uh, joining up at Okinawa, which I'll mention in just a moment, but they were uh, island hopping. They would go from one island to the next and fight the battles. When we talk about the Pacific War, I'll give you uh, some idea how many battles was involved in that. But they slowly, slowly, the process, they were getting closer and closer to the, um, the Japanese home islands throughout this. In July of 1944, the Allies finally capture Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. These were uh, islands close enough that they could fly planes from land bases to uh, attack the home islands of Japan. And in June of 1944, they introduced the, um, the major weapon that was to be used throughout the rest of the war, and that is the, the B-29 Super Fortress. It had a range of almost 4,000 miles, so it could quite easily take off from Tinian or Saipan, uh, Guam was right next door, to attack the uh, home islands of Japan and then return. At that point, they started bombing raids against the islands of Japan. Initially, they tried to do strategic bombing, which meant explosive bombs that they would drop just on muni munitions factories from 30,000 feet, and it didn't work. The winds were too strong, it would blow the bombs off. Well, then Curtis LeMay, in January of 45, took over bombing command, and he started a, a campaign of incendiary bombing dropping uh, napalm and other fire bombs. Most Japanese cities are made of wood, um, wood with paper screens. And so as they began this process, and you get, these are some of the images of the destruction that occurred in uh, Kawasaki, Osaka, um, uh, Kobe, and Nagoya. This is what um, one city looked like after the fire bombing. The fire bombing, affected 67 of the largest cities in Japan over the next several uh, next year and a half. They ended up destroying um, a half million homes. An estimated 900,000 people were killed, and many more than that were left homeless because of the firebombing campaign against the cities in, um, in Japan. The Japanese military and civilian defense were completely unable to deal with this. They'd started out with daytime dropping bombs from 30,000 feet. 
Curtis LeMay started the campaign where they would fly at, at uh, night, low altitude over the cities, and they would come on so quickly that the Japanese were unable to effectively defeat the, their efforts. In particular, on uh, March 9th and 10th of 1945, an operation called Operation Meeting House was a bombing raid over Tokyo in which they uh, killed 100,000 people in that one night. They destroyed 16 square miles of downtown Tokyo. They left 1 million people homeless um, and destroyed a total of 267,000 buildings in one night. Uh, that was far more, by the way, 100,000 dead was far more than were killed at the, bomb, at the day of the bombing in either Hiroshima or Nagasaki with the nuclear weapons. For all of this, um, the Japanese inability to defend this, for all of this destruction, for um, as they were moving forward, still there was no indication from the Japanese of a desire or a willingness to surrender, no matter how much destruction was being rained down. On the 21st of April, well actually from the 1st of April to June 21st, uh, the Battle of Okinawa was the largest and the bloodiest battle of the Pacific War. There were 180,000 U.S. Army and Marines uh, involved against 115,000 Japanese soldiers and perhaps 150,000 Okinawan civilians, half the population of Okinawa. Um, Americans had 75,000 casualties on the ground and 4,900 sailors killed. The Japanese had 94% fatality rate in that battle and half of the population of Okinawa, about 150,000, were killed. Total fatalities, 241,000 in one battle. One of the things that they discovered is that as the Allied forces got closer and closer to Japan, the battles were getting bloodier and bloodier. The Japanese were being more determined all the time to try to prevent the potential invasion eventually of the Japanese home islands. In fact, uh, more than half of all of the fatalities in the Pacific War occurred in the last three and a half months of the Pacific War. Uh, prior to the bombing of Hiroshima. So more than half the casualties in the last three and a half months. Um, all of this is sort of leading up to the main topic for today, but I need to give you kind of an understanding of where we came from. Um, again, despite all of that, there's no willingness, uh, indication of willingness to surrender. And in fact, the Japanese seem to be more and more determined to not um, give up, give in, to not be willing to accept that the um, Allied troops were coming as close as they were. One of the signs of that uh, ultimate determination, even desperation, was the development first at the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which was the battle to retake the Philippines by the Allied forces, and then the Battle of Okinawa were of course the kamikazes, which technically this is an airplane coming in here and here, that's the result. Um, technically they were called special attack units or Special Attack Corps. It involved not only airplanes, but they also had many submarines, they had um, manned torpedoes, they had uh, glider bombs, manned glider bombs, their divers, there were a lot of different kinds of suicide approaches on this. But the uh, at Okinawa alone, the kamikaze flyers were responsible for sinking 38 ships, damaging 368 more, and the 4,900 sailors that were killed were due to kamikaze attacks. Again, no sign of, uh, despite this level of um, real commitment to try to stop the Allies from moving further toward the home islands of Japan, there was no indication of a willingness to give up. For all of this, oh, and another thing is that on Okinawa, there were 1,780 children that were recruited to fight for the Japanese, um, boys as young as 14 years old. Half of them ended up dying. Some, some were recruited for suicide missions to blow up tanks and that sort of thing, but half of the 1,780 died. So again, a sign of uh, the level of commitment that the Japanese had to not be willing to give in to the war. And so all of these are indications of what the Allies were seeing in the, the unwillingness of the Japanese to compromise, to surrender, to uh, in any way step back. After taking Okinawa, one of the goals had been for Okinawa, which is only 340 or so miles from the home islands of Japan, for that to be the primary base for the launch of the invasion of the home islands, which was called Operation Downfall. It was planned to begin in November of 1945. It was in two phases. First off, starting with planes from, um, from Okinawa here to attack the islands of um, Kyushu. It was in the southern part of Kyushu, and in fact, we're going to be going there. Kiran was an area that they had uh, the 
the kamikaze basis. There is a museum that you can visit about the, um, the kamikaze flyers. So once they could attack here from Okinawa, they, if they could capture those bases, that would be an even closer base to support the ultimate invasion near Tokyo. And that was the plan. The problem was, given the determination that the Japanese had shown, they were preparing to, um, they were already beginning to, to call back some of the Kwantung Army, which is the army, the, the Japanese Navy did most of the fighting in the Pacific War. The Japanese Army still had a significant force in China, and they were beginning to recall them in order to prepare for the invasion, and they knew where the invasion would come. They were reinforcing everything here in Kyushu. They knew that's where it would happen. And so for all of this, the um, estimates for the potential casualties for the invasion of the homelands, there were various experts in Washington, in, in London, that were looking at this. The uh, projections were that up to four million American casualties would be the result of this effort, Operation Downfall, to invade the home islands, with as many as one million of those killed. Um, because of the number of casualties they were expecting, wounded and killed, the United States military had made 500,000 Purple Hearts. Purple Heart is the medal given to anyone who's wounded in active in combat. Um, they ended up not having to use them, and so they, they still today have some of those left over. I mean, that gives you an idea of what they were expecting and what the reality was. The Japanese, as I said, knew where it was coming. Um, our estimates were that there would be between 5 and 10 million fatalities on the Japanese side, both primarily military but also civilian. We did know that the civilians were being trained to assist in the defense, even children. Um, and so again, all of this indication of the level of determination the Japanese had not to surrender. Um, the Japanese actually estimated higher fatalities. The vice chief of staff of the Imperial Japanese Navy projected that there would be 20 million Japanese dead as a result of this. All of this to give you some idea what they were facing when they were thinking of invading the Japanese home islands. Another line of thought here. This is um, a group of German technicians during the Second World War um, that are working on a nuclear reactor. They never could get it to work. But they had, in Germany, they had what was called the Uranverein, which was the uranium club. The Germans were working very, very hard to develop a nuclear weapon before the end of the, um, the war. They surrendered in May of 1945, so that was right before all of these things were happening with the, the end of the Japanese war. The Germans had developed a heavy water plant, D2O, it's a deuterium, which is a, a hydrogen molecule with an extra proton in its nucleus that is needed, they thought, for extending the um, the reaction in order to create an explosion. They were developing high-grade uranium. The Germans had some of the finest scientists and engineers in the world at that point, and they were working very hard. American scientists and Western European scientists that had escaped from the Nazis were started warning the Allies that this is what the Germans are working on, and if they're successful, they will have a weapon unlike anything anybody's ever seen. But um, the initial assumption that the Germans had made is that it would take a large quantity of a fissionable material, like uranium, that could, along with a sustaining element like heavy water, to create an explosion that they, to create the kind of weapon they were looking for. Later on, they discovered those assumptions were wrong, uh, that a relatively small amount of uranium could, if handled in the right way, create a significant explosion. So with this, um, the experience that we got from some of the scientists that escaped from Germany, we began to work on this. Now, um, interestingly, uh, the Albert Speer, the German Albert Speer, who was an architect, he wasn't a scientist, he was put in charge of the project by Hitler. He had no idea what the science was involved, and so he ended up taking some of the scientists, and when the, uh, after the invasion of Poland, he decided, I don't even understand what they're doing, so he made them all privates and gave them guns and sent them to the front. <laughs> had Albert Speer not done that, then it, we could have been in trouble, we being the, the Western uh, powers. The United States then began looking into this. On uh, October 11, 1939, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, co-signed it with another scientist, and introduced him to what he called a new field of physics, nuclear physics, that has the potential for developing an, a weapon of extraordinary destructive power. 
FDR didn't didn't really buy into it, but he decided to check it out. So he created a committee for development of substitute materials. Now there's a sexy name for you. <laughs> a committee for development of substitute materials. Later on, the idea being that it's a different kind of explosive, substitute materials. They changed the name because they thought that might actually give, a, give away what they were doing, and they began to call it the Manhattan Development Project because FDR put it under the Army Corps of Engineers, and the office that was managing it was in Manhattan, and the Corps of Engineers always named their projects based upon which office of the Army Corps of Engineers was responsible. Later on, it of course became the Manhattan Project, and they recruited the assistance from Enrico Fermi and many of the other very finest scientists in the world to help develop this. The Army Corps of Engineers uh, general, who is Leslie Groves, was in charge of all the military site. They built all of the facilities. They provided the resources. This is Robert Oppenheimer. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer was the one who was the civilian lead scientist. He gathered the scientists necessary to try to develop the delivery mechanism that, uh, that would make this whole thing work. There were several key places in the United States, and all this was kept very, very secret. Manhattan Project headquarters in Washington, D.C. In the University of Chicago, they had developed the first working a nuclear reactor, and they did it under the stands of the football stadium at University of Chicago. So careful if you ever go to a ball game in Chicago. Um, the, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, they were responsible for trying to develop the uranium that was needed. Um, they particularly needed to be able to create uranium-235, which is an isotope of the more common uranium-238, but it's a very difficult process to separate the two. And so Oak Ridge was primarily uh, trying to develop as much uranium-235 as they could through a, a process. Hanford, Washington, on the other hand, up here at Washington State, they were responsible for developing another um, element that had recently been discovered, which was plutonium, which is also fissionable. It, it's a modified uh, isotope out of uranium as well. So they were working to develop plutonium-239, which is actually easier to produce than uranium-235. And so all of these, these they were trying to develop the fissional materials, while at Los Alamos, New Mexico, they had the, the scientists who were developing the um, devices to deliver the explosion once they had all of the science worked out. There was a like two season long um, series on TV a couple years ago called Manhattan. Did anybody see that? It was about the scientists at Alamogordo, and they had different teams working on different designs, and they were like competing with each other. They ended up with two completely different designs, both of which were used at the end of the war. One um, was the device that was dropped over Hiroshima, and the other over Nagasaki. But the U.S. government ended up spending two billion dollars on this project, uh, which today would be the equivalent of two hundred or twenty-two billion dollars, and one hundred and thirty thousand people were involved. The United States, um, working with Great Britain, they took over the British work, uh, which the British had called their Tube Alloys Project, and the, uh, the British and the Americans were working together on that. In fact, they had signed a Quebec agreement, which said that the Britain had to agree before the United States uh, used any atomic weapons that were developed. Well, what they came up with were two kinds of bombs. The one down here on the left, which initially had been called Thin Man, later on because they changed the design in order to differentiate the change, they called it Little Boy. It was a uranium bomb, uranium-235, a gun-type bomb, which meant there were elements of uranium which from one end an explosion fired it uh, down the barrel inside this bomb and when they contacted one another, the idea is that that contact would create uh, the nuclear explosion. The other bomb, which was a new type, was called Fat Boy, and Fat Boy was the, um, I'm sorry, Fat Man. Fat Man was a plutonium bomb, used a completely different material, and it was a different model. It was an implosion type. Like I say, that TV show, Manhattan, they had two teams working on two designs, and they decided they would both work. Well, they weren't as sure about the plutonium bomb, and so they created this monster. You'll see the fellow sitting by it to give you some idea of the size. This was called Gadget. This was the first nuclear uh, explosive device that was ever created on July 16th of 1945. Now notice that date. July 16th, they dropped the first bomb on August 6th. So they dropped the first bomb less than three weeks after this. But they didn't even know if this was gonna work. So Gadget was a bomb that they exploded at the Trinity test 
in, um, in New Mexico. And this is actually considered the birth of the nuclear age when they set that bomb off. They had no idea how powerful it was going to be. You may have seen the videos of guys standing out there with goggles on and, you know, being blown back. The explosion of Gadget, they could see the blinding flash 200 miles away. It set up a 40,000 foot mushroom cloud. It blew out civilian windows 100 miles away and left a one half mile crater of glass where it fused the sand into glass. And this is an image of the, the Gadget um, test. So they knew, and this was a plutonium bomb because they thought that uranium worked, they didn't know about uh, the uranium, uh, plutonium. So here we have Japan is getting more and more determined even to the point of suicide bombers and using child warriors to continue to fight to the last man. And some of their, some of their military were actually saying that, we will fight to the last person. Um, the destruction of the cities, the fact that at the end of the war there was a ring of American submarines that was cutting off deliveries of any supplies into the home islands of Japan. The fact that they were beginning to suffer famine, they had almost no oil, not enough oil to even send ships out even if the submarines hadn't been there. All of these things, and the number of fatalities that happened within a few months at the very end of the war, um, all of this was taken into account in the consideration of do we, you know, do we employ these, these horrific weapons. Um, Hiroshima, one of the two cities that ended up uh, having the bomb dropped, Hiroshima was previously not bombed because it did not have any aircraft uh, development capability, and that had been a primary focus of the Allied bombing, the American bombing, despite the fact that it had a, a significance militarily and industrially. It was the headquarters of the Second General Army, and therefore commanding all of the soldiers responsible, the Japanese soldiers responsible for protecting the southern part of, of Japan. It was a headquarters for the 59th Army, the 2nd and 29th Divisions. It was a center for supply and logistics for the Japanese military. Um, as well as being a major shipping port, it was a significant uh, base for the, the Japanese military in the southern part of the country. So on the 6th of August, an airplane, which was named the Enola Gay, after the mother of the pilot, Paul Tibbets, left from Tinian Airfield down here and flew to Hiroshima. And they left early, early in the morning to fly to Hiroshima. They got over the the city, it was clear, they dropped the first bomb at 8.15 a.m. It exploded um, 1,900 feet above the ground with a force of 12 to 15 kilotons. That's 12 to 15,000 tons of dynamite equivalent. Um, 90,000 people were immediately killed. Tens of thousands or more would die over the next four months or so from radiation poisoning. So the total fatalities at Hiroshima were about 146,000, as best we know. The absolute destruction in the center of the city means that if whole families were killed, there was no one to report that there were other people there, and so we simply didn't know. 90% um, of the city, center of the city was destroyed. Uh, five square miles were just flattened. Um, this is what Hiroshima looked like before the bomb was dropped. This is what it looked like after the bomb was dropped. There was nothing to speak of standing anymore. There were a few buildings uh, near the, uh, the Hypo Center, in fact, that were reinforced concrete. And if you go to Hiroshima, you'll almost certainly go to the, uh, the Peace Park and the Atomic Bomb Museum, and in the Peace Park they have a dome, and it had been the pre uh, prefectural building there, and it is still standing. It was left as it was, with a few safety adjustments, and as a sign of uh, what, what had happened there. Um, I'll go back to this one. The second attempt, I mean, they dropped that bomb on the 6th of August. Two days later, uh, no word had come from, from Japan in terms of reaction to this, at least not to the Western Allies. They had been given a, a declaration, the Potsdam Declaration, that said you must, the Japanese military must unconditionally surrender. They had actually adapted that wording because the, the military was their concern, and they, and they uh, ended up later on proving that the emperor was not to be dis deposed, he was not tried for war crimes, um, there was not an effort to try to completely change the Japanese culture, all the things they were afraid of. They were hoping to get a conditional surrender, and that's why they were holding out. But after the dropping of the bomb, no word came. Two days later, on the 8th uh, of August, 
the Russians declared war against Japan and invaded through Manchuria and ended up getting all the way down into, North, into Korea. We'll talk about that when we talk about the Korean War. That's how you ended up with a communist North Korea and a you know, democratic <laughs> South Korea. The, uh, on the 9th then, having heard nothing, the decision was made to drop a second bomb on Nagasaki. Nagasaki was, uh, whereas Hiroshima had not been bombed at all, Nagasaki had been bombed some, but very limited. Um, they, in Nagasaki, it was one of the largest seaports. They did production of, of weapons, ships, military equipment, um, and unlike Hiroshima, Nagasaki was almost entirely wooden buildings. There were no concrete buildings, no reinforced buildings, but Nagasaki has hills all around, and so when the bomb was dropped, and this was a plutonium bomb, uh, it actually was more powerful. The plutonium implosion type bomb, Fat Man, um, went off with a, an effective explosive rate of 22 kilotons as opposed to 10 to 12 on the Hiroshima bomb. Um, and that bomb, the big, the fat one, weighed almost 10,000 pounds. Because of the hills that are scattered around Nagasaki, um, only 2.6 miles compared to five square miles of Hiroshima, only 2.6 square miles were destroyed in Nagasaki. 39,000 people were killed immediately. Uh, 80,000, it's estimated, died within a few months because of not, not just radiation poisoning, but also um, injuries, wounds, burns that came from it. So the total they were looking at, at uh, between the two is about 236,000 killed um, in total. It, it was a horrendous thing, but this is the same sort of picture for Nagasaki. This is what it looked like before the bomb. This is the same area after the bomb. You will notice here, this is a church, uh, uh, Ujumaya church, and it has been rebuilt. This on the left is the Hiroshima explosion. In addition to the planes that dropped the bomb, it was the Enola Gay over Hiroshima and the boxcar was the name of the plane over Nagasaki. They had two other planes flying with them that were responsible for um, for equipment to analyze what happened and to photograph what happened. So they, this is Nagasaki, Hiroshima. This is the peace building that you will see now. They left it standing in Hiroshima. Um, but otherwise, this is what it looked like. This in Nagasaki was, was the um, Ujamaya church. It was a Christian church. Nagasaki had more Christians in it than any any other city in Japan because it had been a city that had been open for many, many years for trade. And so um, they ended up completely rebuilding that church. After the second bomb was dropped on the 9th of August, the emperor, contrary to all custom, insisted that the military council accept the unconditional surrender. And he recorded on a record uh, a, his own words accepting the surrender. There were significant efforts to try to prevent it from being played. There was uh, an effort by the senior commanders of the military to, um, to refuse to surrender. Many of them committed seppuku, suicide. Then junior commanders tried to uh, rebel. Students, believing that the emperor had been, you know, was taken captive and forced to do this, they tried to, to take over control. There were a lot of efforts to try to accept, uh, to prevent the accepting of the surrender, but on August 15th, they played the voice of the emperor. It's the first time most Japanese had ever heard the emperor uh, accepting the surrender. And then on September 2nd, um, a little over two weeks later, the USS battleship Missouri was the site of the official uh, signing of the, the, the surrender by Japan. It was received by the senior commander of the Allied powers, uh, Douglas MacArthur. This, again, is what it looks like today. That's what it looked like then. This is the prefectural uh, building, and you'll see that if you go there. This is what the um, Rajamaya church looked like. This is what it looks like today. They completely rebuilt it, unlike the tower. And so that church still stands, red brick church there. So the question, why did this happen? There has always been, since that time, debate, arguments, ethical arguments, historical arguments as to whether or not the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were necessary. What was the motivation? Uh, was it completely unethical? I mean, the idea of bombing civilian areas is something that ended up being most of the Second World War, you know, and, and not the Germans, of course, V-2 rockets and bombs in London and other major cities 
the idea of bombing of Dresden and cities on the mainland of Europe. This is something that had, had just, that had what, that's what war became in the Second World War. We don't really know whether Japan would have surrendered without these bombs being dropped. Um, one of the things that, that has been frequently said, but only since 1965, in 1965, 20 years after the events, an American historian named Gar Alper, Alperovitz uh, claimed that the dropping of the bombs was what he called atomic diplomacy, and that Truman's motivation was to try to intimidate the Russians, who did not yet have an atomic bomb, they didn't get one until 1949, in order to limit their expansionist desires, because Truman was committed to containing the spread of communism, and that's true, he was. But um, whether or not that was a factor, um, we don't know. That is the, the uh, standard accepted explanation in Japan these days. You will see it at the museums, if you go to the peace museums, um, on some of the displays, and it is the thing that, that many Japanese school children are taught, is the bombs were dropped by the Americans in order to make a point to the Russians. That may have been part of the motivation. We don't know that. But to me, much in my study, much more significant were the fact that despite the um, rampant destruction of 67 major cities, the recognition, even within the Japanese military, that they could not win the war, the fact that they were showing signs of such desperations as suicide bombers, and I'll talk about the motivation for that when we talk about samurai a little bit, by the way, um, plus child soldiers, the fact that they were facing a famine, and had the war been extended, the expectation is that tens of millions would have died from famine because the rice crops were a fraction of what they had been years before. By 1945, um, it would have been quite terrible. For all of that pressure, all of that negativity in terms of all the bad things that had happened and they saw coming, still there was no gesture on the part of the Japanese to surrender. That, I believe, is one of the major reasons. A second major reason is when they, uh, tr not just Truman, but other leaders, military leaders and civilian leaders in the US, Britain, and elsewhere, when they looked at the possibility of having uh, to lose 20 million lives between Allied and Japanese, and many, many more, millions more in casualties, wounds uh, for the invasion of Japan, fewer people died here, and again, a lot of people don't realize that in one night of firebombing over Tokyo, they killed more people than died at, at the night of the bombs being dropped, or the day of the bombs being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I think that had I been in, in Truman's shoes, I would have been inclined to do the same thing, given the evidence that was there, the reluctance of the Japanese to surrender despite the horrendous things that had happened to them, and the, the, what would have happened if they had continued with the plan, Operation um, Downfall, to <laughs> invade uh, Japan. It still was a horrendous thing. It led to a nuclear, um, don't misunderstand me, it led to a nuclear arms race, it led to the death of a quarter of a million people in those two cities uh, over you know, a period of time from it, not just the explosion but injuries, radiation, etc. That can never be explained away. And yet, they were in a situation, I believe, where they had to make decisions against uh, the range of evils. Questions about any of that? I've actually gone a little bit longer than usual. I usually try to talk for 45 minutes and then take questions. Any questions? Yes? How did they clean up the radiation so quickly? Most of the radiation, um, when the, the explosions were so intense that most of the radiation w went up with the clouds. They ended up having black rain after that. But in Hiroshima, particularly, there was a typhoon that struck um, in September. And the typhoon quite literally washed away a lot of the radiation. So uh, they actually thought after the bomb was dropped that Hiroshima would never recover, that it would always be a wasteland. But surprisingly, the next spring, grass started coming up, uh, buds started coming out on trees that they thought were dead, and um, because of all of the different factors, you know, the rain, the typhoon, um, they ended up with very little uh, continuing radiation problem there. And so that's not a factor today. You don't have to, you know, wear a, a radiation measure if you go to Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Yes? Uh, in, in a class I just took, one of the things that came out is Nagasaki at the last minute was chosen because Kyoto was going to get bombed. And, and there was such adamant opposition to right. bombing Kyoto. Right. It wasn't Kyoto, it was Kokura. 
which is another industrial city. Kyoto had originally been put on the list, and the Secretary of War, Stimson, had, had his honeymoon in Kyoto. And it is, you know, it's one of the old capitals after Nara, one of the oldest capitals of, J of Japan. The beautiful temples and the gardens, and Stimson knew that. And so he told him to take it off the list, and he got Truman to back him up on that. So Kyoto was never, uh, never technically, and the, the, the military guys kept trying to put it on there. But Kokuro was another city, and that was the initial, um, the second bomb was supposed to be dropped in Kokuro. It was clouded in. There was smoke, there was clouds. They tried three runs over Kokuro, and the understanding was that unless they could have a visual sight of the target location, then they would not drop the bomb. If necessary, they would drop it in the ocean rather than drop it somewhere if they couldn't see where it was going. So, but they did have alternates, and after Kokuro was um, three times, they didn't, they, uh, Turn to the alternate target, which was Nagasaki, and it was clear there. Questions? Yeah. Here first. Here first. Would it uh, be possible just to drop in front of Tokyo and make a big splash and have right. every, everybody seen and not kill so many people? So what, wouldn't it have been possible to drop it somewhere where there were people, but still show what the power of it was? That was serious to consider. There were people that were advocating that we simply make a demonstration someplace where people won't die. But the decision was, given the absolute adamant um, sense that the Japanese military had that they were not going to give in. They believed that uh, if you didn't drop it someplace that it did damage in a city and people, then the Japanese would have interpreted that as an unwillingness by the U.S. military to drop an atomic weapon. I mean, one of the reasons that they were motivated to drop a second one is because the, some, some people believe the Japanese would think, well, they had one, but they don't have any more. At, that, at the time that the bombs were dropped, we only had two, but we were less than 30 days away from being able to have others prepared. And after the first bomb was dropped and they did not, um, they did not offer surrender, they Groves, uh, Leslie Groves, the general, major general in charge, he sent the order to start putting the other materials for others. And so in less than a month, they would have had more. But they did consider that, and there were people who advocated it, but they said, you know, we've already destroyed 67 other cities, and they have not said anything, unless we, you know, make a real show of it, then they're not, it's not going to have an effect. And again, I sound like I'm defending that. You know, I'm not. I think there are reasons. I think I probably would have made the same decision had I been there, but I, would have, I, I wouldn't have slept the rest of my life. Yes? Since we were out of measurable material at that time, what was the status of the Japanese program to develop a bomb? The Japanese had begun a program, like the, like the Germans, to develop a bomb, but they really had made no progress to speak of. You know, they had not emphasized it enough and they, they didn't have a real focus. We did have other fissionable material, particularly plutonium, which is much easier to develop. And once the plutonium bomb, with Gadget and then with the, the Fat Man, uh, was demonstrated, then the idea of having enough fissionable material was no longer as big a problem, because it was much easier to, to develop from uranium, the plutonium isotope, than it was to try to get uranium-235 out of uranium-238. Yes? Didn't the Japanese have also Well, there were relationships between Japan and um, Germany and Italy. They were part of the Axis powers. Uh, the, there, there was a limitation to that. They, there was not a guarantee of you know, a response if somebody were attacked. But by this time, Germany was out of the war anyway. Germany had already been defeated in May. So by the time we got to the end, um, interestingly enough, the Jap Japanese also had a treaty with Russia up until April before uh, August when the, the bombs were dropped. And it was a non-aggression treaty, but Stalin, who was a master manipulator, you know, one of the most evil people probably that ever lived, but he was very good at what he did, he had figured that uh, by having a non-aggression treaty with the Japanese, he didn't have to worry about his southern borders uh, with China and Japan, he could focus on Germany until they were defeated, but he already by, you know, by early, by late spring, you know, before Germany um, was finally defeated, he was already beginning to position troops and materiel uh, in the east in order to be able to invade, which he did on the 8th of August. Um, but the, the Japanese had continued to hope that even though they didn't like the Russians, they had had a non-aggression treaty and they hoped the Russians would work for them to try to get a better, um, a conditional surrender. And their primary concerns were that they did not want the emperor to be deposed or to be charged with war crimes, which some of the allies were advocating pretty strongly. They did not want 
culture to be forced, um, you know, to change. And um, Douglas MacArthur, and I'll talk later about the fact I'm not Douglas MacArthur's biggest fan. I think he made some horrible mistakes in the in the progress of the war. Uh, but one thing he did brilliantly is the way he handled the Japanese when he became the senior commander of the Allied Powers. The fact that he insisted that the emperor not be deposed or that he not be tried, <coughs> that he showed respect for him, even though he made it clear who was in charge. I mean, he was he was in charge of the country. Um, very quickly, the Japanese realized we were not going to do to them what we could have, since they were defeated people. And we'll talk a little bit about that again when we talk later about that sort of samurai attitude and what's involved in all that. And so that's why um, the relationships between Japan and the United States um, developed a positive direction very soon after that. Yes? question is that in addition to, I mentioned the American historian in 1965, which is 20 years after the events, suggesting that it was a, an atomic diplomacy, that the United States dropped the bomb in order to try to intimidate Russia. Uh, the suggestion was in the same book, and I have not read his book, I've only read quotes from it and, and, uh, and other reviews of it, that uh, there were also discussions going on between the emperor or military, and um, I'm not aware of any of that. As I say, the emperor did not involve himself in political things. This is one of the things that seems a little crazy to us, but the one who was in charge of the country, who was considered a god, the very fact that he was considered a god, and we'll talk about that, a great kami, when we talk about religions of Japan, you'll understand that a little bit better. Um, he would not sully himself with getting involved in political or military matters. That was considered unacceptable for him, and so he would not do that, and yet, Sort of like if you if you watch the TV show The Crown about you know the young Queen Elizabeth, how she's the Queen of England, but she still can't do a lot of things she wants to do. You know, there's just there's either tradition or there are other people in the government that prevent her from doing what she would like to do. Um, the same thing was true of the Emperor when he when he called a, a meeting of the War Council as it was called and told them we are going to accept the unconditional surrender. They almost just didn't know what to do. You know that that he was stepping in like that because that would never happen. Um, and yet he did. So the idea that he was having, come, the emperor was involved in conversations outside would not have happened given the traditions that they had. Uh, I'm not aware of any of the military. Some of the senior military uh, in Japan were in favor of accepting the surrender, but the majority of them were still maintaining that they should hold out and if they, if they were continue to be able to create enough damage in the battles, then the, they may be able to, to successfully get a conditional surrender rather than unconditional surrender. So that was part of the motivation for it. 